your information seems compelling. And what's been the response when you have presented this to influential people around the world? Um, what's been the response from the media, the universities, the scientific community, the medical community, the government agencies, and the medical industry? It all depends on access. You know, if I get a chance to speak to an open-minded scientist, whether he's pro-GMO or anti-GMO, they come around to a serious understanding of why this stuff is dangerous. I was speaking to a molecular biologist today who was totally on board. Molecular biology is the, is the group that does the genetic engineering. She was like, and I started, as soon as I heard that she was a molecular biologist, she was on board, but I just started talking about the, some of the details in scientific jargon and she was like, yeah, I know, yeah, I know, yeah, I know. I talked years ago, I talked to someone who was pro-GMO. She was a professor, I think I was speaking at the college. And I started to explain the research that they don't do and the things that could go wrong. She was furious at the biotech industry because she had been brainwashed thinking it was safe. When I talk to um, you know, politicians, if they have the time and they take the time, they're convinced. But oftentimes, they don't give me access if they've already drank the Kool-Aid. Like I was, I was brought by people in Australia. They published my book, Genetic Roulette, gave it to all the elected officials in the country. And they flew me around because they were trying to prevent the release of genetically engineered canola. So in the states that were keeping the moratorium, I got a chance to speak to all the ministers of agriculture and some ministers of health, and, and it was no problem. In the two states that they were planning to release it, I never got the meeting. Three weeks later after I left, they released the canola, and everything I had predicted to the other agriculture ministers came true. They ended up losing their premium. They lost some of their marketplace. There was contamination. There was no benefit to the farmers, just as they'd been, just the opposite of what they had been promised by the biotech industry. But I had no access. So it really depends. And a lot of times, the biotech industry works overtime to prevent people like me from speaking to decision makers. And when we do, we can turn things around. What can an individual do who wants to help stop GMOs? I would say an individual should eat organic. So protect your own life and your family. Share information with others. And I recommend subscribing to our information. I'm going to give two websites, responsibletechnology.org and livehealthybewell.com, two different organizations that I'm part of. I have a podcast, and we have newsletters, et cetera. And donating, donating to the Institute for Responsible Technology. Right now, we need to alert the world about the possibility of replacement of nature by gene-edited organisms in mass by tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions. And that's an irreversible phenomenon. And it's already, we're already behind time. So the Institute for Responsible Technology that I founded, we pioneered the behavior change messaging that changed the eating habits of so many people. I spoke in 45 countries, and we've been very effective. But now we need to get the whole world aware that we have arrived at an inevitable time in human civilization, inevitable, where we can recode uh, the structure of the DNA, re direct the, the streams of evolution with very little money, and we don't have the balancing ethics, morality, scientific understanding, or long-term vision that should accompany this ability. So we need to implement a no-release policy. Yeah, do your GMO in a laboratory, protect it, do not release it. It could change the gene pool forever. And it's true that even injecting Roundup into pregnant mice caused the great-grandchildren to suffer more than the grandchildren who suffered more than the children because there's an epigenetic effect that gets inherited. So even the chemicals that we're releasing can have a devastating effect on future generations. But right now, we, need, we are desperate for the financial resources so we can build the staff and the materials. So if you go to protectnaturenow.com, you can watch a three-minute video. And perhaps by the time this is up, there'll be other videos, because we'll have received funding. And we can do other videos about the genetically engineered bacteria, about various, about the, the RNA 
uh, interference technologies, about these new uh, types of GMOs. We need to build up the resources of educational materials and build a coalition around the planet so that all the different groups, from climate change to ocean saving to animal rights to gardeners to birders, all talk about protecting nature now. Protecting nature now from a widespread replacement so that it's taught in curriculum in schools, so that it becomes part of the institutional review board policy and academic policy, so that everyone on the planet realizes we're playing with matches next to a, a fire, potential fire, that could engulf all future generations and all living beings. We have to get the word out wide around the planet, and we have to bring in religious leaders, scientific leaders, indigenous people, media, politics, because any country, any academic institution, any transnational corporation could pump out so many dangerous GMOs, it could affect every ecosystem where they end up for all future generations. So we need help financially. So that's one thing individuals can do that would help us. And that's responsibletechnology.org. Why are you so concerned about GMOs, yet the United States governmental agencies such as the USDA and FDA don't even seem to think it's a problem? The FDA was given a mandate to promote GMOs. A friend of mine went to a lecture years ago with the, one of the top people from the FDA, and one of his PowerPoint slides says the two, the two purposes of the FDA, second one was promote biotechnology. It's their job. You know, and that's the same thing they were told, the EPA, and they told the USDA. It's basically the enforcement wing of the biotech industry. We know from the documents made public from the lawsuit, the three lawsuits that where Monsanto, now Bayer, was found guilty of causing the cancer of the plaintiffs and hiding the evidence. We know that they had their own, um, their own lapdogs in the EPA. Their person was in charge of policy at the FDA. Their lapdogs were running the EPA's evaluation of, of glyphosate in terms of its ability to cause cancer. The biotech governor of the year is the current USDA uh, secretary, and the previous one was another biotech governor of the year. It's loaded dice. It's absolutely captured organizations. And I remember speaking to one, someone, someone from the FDA in a fairly high position. And I just happened to drop two pieces of information about research that I've been talking about for years. She goes, huh, new information. She was totally unaware of the information that I told her. It was significant dangers of GMOs. It just flew past. 